Well, good afternoon, Paul. Welcome to Entrepreneurs Business and Finance. Hey, Henry. So Paul and I, uh, one of my very good friends, uh, even though we live in separate cities now, we grew up together in Arlington, Virginia. He's still in Arlington, Virginia. When I go up to visit, which I like to do fairly often, he'll off, I'll often end up staying uh, at his house because he's a very generous person. And I was thinking before this call of all the things that we you know, have shared over the years. We're at each other's weddings. Our parents were friends. We've been to funerals, unfortunately. Uh, we. Um, I prefer brothers, weddings over funerals, Henry. Yes, sir. <laughs> our our uh, brothers are both doctors and both trained at the Mayo Clinic, as did your father. I used to go see your father if I had various orthopedic injuries. Uh, I played golf with your dad. Um, and uh, really, the story still goes on. So I'm very glad to have you here because although I know some of the stories, we, story, played, a, we played a lot of golf together, and I actually had the best shot of my life uh, playing with you down in Dallas one day. That's right. That's right. I remember that very well. Uh, so I'll let you tell the story because it's very exciting. I know it has to do with your daughter's best friend, and your daughter is a part of this as well. And you have it long experience in the biopharmaceutical industry, but lately you have, not that lately, but in the last number of years, you took a big chance, and I, which I think is going to pay off for you and for lots of people, and uh, became an entrepreneur full-fledged. Um, how did you, uh, how did that get started in your own words? Well, as I often say, uh, doing startups is no country for old men. <laughs> I um, remind myself that the founders of Home Depot, uh, Ken Langone, and who's the other guy? Um, Chuck's, uh lives down in Atlanta. These Those guys started Home Depot at age 55. So we're not too old to do this, Henry. But uh, I would recommend <laughs> being an entrepreneur to people much younger than us. Um, no. Uh, Bernard, Bernard Marcus, is that who you're thinking of? Bernie, yeah, Bernie Marcus. Yeah, That's Bernie right. Marcus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they didn't start Home Depot until they were 55, I think. Anyway. I actually didn't know that story. That's pretty cool. Yeah, but you, you know, the, we started the company because this disease found us. Um, I'd been in the biopharmaceutical world my entire career. Uh, Johnson and Johnson, Amgen, Beringer, Ingelheim. But it wasn't until my daughter's best friend, some of our best friend's daughter, was diagnosed with this very deadly bone disease called osteosarcoma in February of 2017. I'm looking out the window from my house. I can see their house from here. And I, I, I know I'm ruining the suspense, but I'm going to tell the end of the story first because Olivia is doing great. And she's been six years cancer free now, and she sits on the board of OS therapies. But when she got sick, there weren't a lot of options and half the kids that get this disease end up dying of the disease. So we wanted to make sure we changed the odds for Olivia. And then in the long run, we've realized we think we can change the odds for not only kids with osteosarcoma, but maybe some other solid tumors as well. Um, it would certainly be my life's work if I were just to impact the overall survival of just one small uh, rare disease. But just imagine, Henry, if we could do this with some other solid tumors as well. It, frankly, blood tumors, you know, the industry has been very successful in a lot of blood tumors. The solid tumors have been challenging. And just like osteosarcoma, breast cancer, or some of these other bigger cancers, they present as a solid tumor. It gets resected. Uh, the body gets blasted with chemo and radiation. And if the disease doesn't come back, the patient's fine and they live their life the rest of their life, or maybe some side effects from the long-term side effects from the chemo and radiation. But in general, they live their life, the rest of their life, relatively normal. And half the kids that get osteosarcoma, it comes back. And in solid tumors, when it comes back, it doesn't usually come back to the place where it originated. And breast cancer, it doesn't come back to the breast. It actually, these little micrometastases are looking for two things, oxygen and soft tissue. And as a result, they end up landing in the lungs and the brain. 
And it's the same with osteosarcoma, same with breast cancer, same with a lot of solid tumors. And that's where your survival rate drops. So we wanted to find a way of preventing those little Darwinian bastards that survive the chemo and radiation from landing in the lungs and the brain. And we ended up, first of all, starting a nonprofit. Uh, my daughters were on the board of that. Um, uh, I, help, I help fund it. Obviously, Olivia's father helped start that uh, as well and fund it. And we've raised, I think, close to $3 million for osteosarcoma research. And a week before, we had a bunch of doctors coming into town to really teach them about the importance of genetic testing. I read in our trade magazine about a technology that was being given up. And I knew why, and because osteosarcoma is a very rare disease. But what we've done is build a company around that disease, but also built it around other solid tumors as well. Long answer. Sorry. No, that's a terrific answer. Yeah. And I was struck by that because I remember you started, uh, and actually I know, I met Olivia and I know her father uh, uh, from growing up in Arlington. Uh, parents knew each other, same kind of thing. So it is a very close circle. And what a terrific family as it is yours. Um, do the... Um, yeah, I remember when you made that step to, and I recall, and I may be off on this, but you went from basically one cancer to three, and then if you get one of the three or all three of the three, then you can take that expertise and that research and knowledge and help with all sorts of other cancers. So it's not exactly like you got to hit this target. You're making progress no matter what is is the layman's terms from my understanding of medical research. Is, is that accurate? Can you correct me where I'm off on that? Well, I think there are couple of questions in there and I'll try and kind of parse it out with the appropriate answers. First of all, um, when we started the company, we started before that with the nonprofit, that nonprofit and seven or eight other nonprofits have invested in the company um, because their primary mission is advancing research. So we do have a clinical trial going right now that is being paid for by those investments and that is advancing research. It is going well. Uh, we have 41 kids that have been enrolled uh, across 21 different facilities across the country, uh, children's hospitals across the country, and they're receiving our therapy. It's stimulating the body's immune system to go out and fight these little micrometastases. Um, but if, in, if it seems to be going well, but if that trial did fail, we the 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 mission of those nonprofits still would have been fulfilled in that they would be advancing research. Um, but if it does well, and if we're successful and we develop a new treatment for osteosarcoma, which would be the first new treatment in over 40 years, then they've done more than just advanced research. They've brought a new therapy to market. Vertex is a pharmaceutical company that was financially supported by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation a few years ago to the tune of $150 million. Uh, the royalties that Vertex sold and gave the proceeds to uh, the Cystic Fibrosis was $5.3 billion or $4.3 billion. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation can now use that money to not only develop more treatments because there weren't many treatments for cystic fibrosis, just like there aren't any new treatments for osteosarcoma. They can then start working on cures and then ultimately prevention, which is what nonprofits of disease diseases are all about, right? Is treat, cure, prevent. So I think that was one of your questions. The other question is that we've when we first started, we were a one-hit wonder. We had this one technology for osteosarcoma. As a business model, that is very challenging. If we failed on our clinical trial that's going on now, which I don't think it is, it seems to be working pretty well. Um, there are certainly kids alive that wouldn't be alive otherwise. Um, but if if we had failed with that, just one technology, would have we would have been done. And... I think we have a better ability to affect not just osteosarcoma, but other solid tumors, because if this does work in osteosarcoma, we'll do a bundle trial, phase three bundle trial in other solid tumors 
But we also brought on another technology that's really hot in the biotech space right now. It's called antibody drug con conjugates, otherwise known as ADCs. And if you look at the last 20, 25 deals over the last 12 to 14 months in the biotech space, the big ones, uh, anywhere from 400 million to 43 billion uh, are in this ADC space. And what that is, I always often describe it as a cruise missile uh, with payloads attached to it uh, with these little silicone linkers, which is our intellectual property special sauce, which are pH sensitive. But that targeting ligand directs the whole cruise missile, if you will, to a certain part of the body where the cancer is located. And then the cancer environment eats away at those silicone linkers and drops these multiple payloads into and around the cancer environment, debulking these large solid tumors. So our original technology is to prevent those little micrometastases from landing in the lungs. Our next technology, which is the really hot ADC space, and for which we have some very particular next generation advantages is really to debulk these large solid tumors. So both of our platform technologies uh, dovetail nicely to each other. Wow. And from a business standpoint right now, I, I admire your perseverance as a fellow entrepreneur. Um, I know it takes a lot of uh, stick to in this, I'll call it. And uh, I know you, um, you made public about how you cashed in some of your retirement. And so uh, it wasn't like you were uh, coasting in this with an extra uh, whole amount of money to fund this thing uh, without any problem. You, you took some side. Yeah, Henry, what you're referring to uh, was a quote in the Arlington Magazine, our local uh, community magazine that Henry and I grew up in and uh, that, that was an incredible article about why we developed the company. And, and um, there was only one misquote in the entire thing. Uh, it, it said that I had said that we cashed in. I, I had said that I had cashed in my retirement for this. I never, I never told the reporter that. It was actually my chief medical officer who told her that because I would never have actually brought that up. But yeah, my daughter's college funds are in this. My retirement funds in this. Um, the boat has pushed off the dock. Well, um, that's also a story of a lot of uh, entrepreneurs I've known uh, that have been, um, uh, uh, whatever you think of Elon Musk. Elon Musk. I'm reading his biography, and he's uh, uh, re-upped with all his money like three or four times at this point, um, and. Uh, so that's, uh, hey, maybe you're the next, uh, I don't know, are you going to be the wealthiest man in the world? That's a pretty big uh, step. But uh, I think you're more concerned about um, saving some lives and uh, making a contribution. So I'll, I'll tell you, and Henry, I learned this at J&J, &J, and it, 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 anyone that has worked at J&J, &J, it's usually a kind of a guiding principle for them. Every decision we make, it is about the patient first. So if we have a decision to make, what's the best interest of the patient? And then obviously, what's in the best interest of caregivers, of the community, and, and our shareholders. But I think if you do the other three, then the shareholders would be just fine. This is what I call a do good, do well investment. And, you know, to be part of our mission to have helped with treatments around a very rare disease uh, in kids. It's, it's, it's a horrible disease and then it attacks teenagers after puberty in the long bones. So if you, you think this is your distal femur, uh, so this is the start of your kneecap, this would be your tibia. There's a bone plates right here and in the tibia and the distal humerus or proximal humerus of the shoulder where the bone plate comes together after puberty. And as a result, because girls get puberty a little earlier than boys, girls get it a little earlier than boys, osteosarcoma. And there's just a miscalculation in that growth plate coming together. And that's where the osteosarcoma takes hold. Well, it really is heartbreaking when you uh, hear the stories and then hear it graphically. But the, the positive thing is, uh, 
success is in the air as far as the trials and as far as what's working and as far as continuing to be able to provide the financing to advance not only research, but uh, but cures. So um, I think, uh, you know, you have to have steps along the way. So congratulations on Thank you. a number of the first few steps. And uh, I believe there'll be many, many more successful ones to come. And thanks for sharing this from your heart. And because I know you, I know it's patients first. So thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks, Andy. Talk to you soon, Paul.